So imagine you're a fisherman on an island in the Pacific Ocean a few hundred years ago. You've had some recent success in fishing and now you'd like to buy a bigger boat. Well, before there were computers and spreadsheets and printers or even pen and paper, how in the world would you conduct such a large transaction? How would you know who owned each boat and how much each boat was worth? Well, basically you need a full monetary system. This is the story of how a small island in the Pacific Ocean created one of the world's first systems of money and record keeping that is surprisingly similar to the technology that we use today. Humans have always had a need to organize information. We are doing a deep dive into the history and future of database technologies and how builders have leveraged data and collaboration to innovate throughout time. The future of the database is brought to you by PlanetScale, a serverless database built for developers. Don't invest more in operations. Let PlanetScale handle database operations for you with non-blocking schema changes, auto resource scaling, schema rewinds, and millions of connections. The only database you'll ever need. At PlanetScale, we are obsessed with building the database of the future and are excited to share this journey with you all. There are three basic components to any monetary system. First, you need something that is rare, hard, or laborsome to procure or create. This is what makes it valuable. Second, you need trust in the system by those using it. And third, you need a public record of knowledge of who owns what. I'm Dr. Scott Fitzpatrick. I'm a professor of archaeology and associate director for research at the Museum of Natural and Cultural History at the University of Oregon. I am an archaeologist that specializes in island and coastal regions in different parts of the world, although most of my research takes place in the Caribbean and Pacific Islands. Scott recently told us about the Yapis, a group of people living on an island in the Pacific Ocean who created one of the world's first monetary record-keeping systems using large stones called rye. Imagine a large stone about the size of a small car in the shape of a circle. And the center of that circle is another circle that's cut out. Hundreds of years ago on an island called Yap, you might find the Yapis transporting one of these large circular stones back to their island. The Yapis would visit a nearby island called Palau, where they would shape large slabs of limestone into the circular money called rye. Yapis stone money, as it's often called, or rye stones, were the largest portable items ever moved over open ocean and the Pacific before European contact. The oral traditions in Yap talk about how Yapis navigators traveled to Palau, which is about 250 miles south of their island group, and had found limestone. Once shaped, the rye stones were brought back to the island of Yap and actually became their form of currency. In fact, rye stones became a very effective currency because of the amount of work involved and the risk involved in bringing them back, which made them both scarce and valuable. Oral traditions talk about there being kind of a number of different criteria that they used for assigning value to, to rye. The scarcity of the material is kind of a big one. They not only needed to find that resource, but they needed to get permission for it too, and probably involve some level of negotiation with Palauans or Palauan chiefs or villages to, to have access to those. The shape is also pretty important. The size was also important too, but that's also on a relative scale because the largest stones in Yap are not the most valuable. Actually, the ones that were carved and brought over before Europeans arrived were considered to be much more valuable because of the risk involved and other things. Risk being another one of those criteria of just the, you know, the labor and the energy and the risk involved in trying to not only get a quarrying party to leave Yap and then just using watercraft and having to maintain those was a lot of the work of getting over there, carving these stones and bringing them back. So a lot of energy expenditure certainly required as part of that too. So all of these, you know, some people sort of like say, well, it's just limestone, you know, uh, that that's found everywhere. Why is it so valuable? And I kind of use a rough corollary of, well, they're not really so different as how we might perceive diamonds today. You know, the cut and the shape and the clarity, those are all kind of important things. And, you know, I think if uh, you flooded the free market with all the diamonds known in the world today, at least the ones that are natural, they'd probably be a whole lot cheaper. New stones could be added with time, much like our government prints additional money today. 
I think about for the U.S. economy, or the U.S. Treasury uh, controls the amount of dollar bills that are created every year. And if they were just to print off infinite dollar bills, money would be even more arbitrary and contribute to things like inflation that I think we'll have the opportunity to talk about um, in a little bit as well. So it is interesting to think about something so old and how some of those basic principles, the idea of value, just haven't really changed over the course of hundreds and thousands of years. In addition to the stones themselves, the Yapis developed an entire system of ownership. During a special ceremony, one of these large stones could be transferred or exchanged for goods or services. The island chief would preside over this transaction, and those witnessing the transaction would serve as proof that it happened. Oral traditions talk about this a lot, like a chief of village would sponsor that expedition. They would bring these stones back and the chief or chiefs would you know, divide these up or send them out. And this was a very sort of public display. You can imagine uh, your you know, husbands or your brothers or your, you know, whoever um, being gone for months on end, maybe even years uh, coming back. And this would have been quite an event, them you know, showing up with these stones or even maybe even just a single stone and people coming to say you know, hello to the people that they had been away from for so long and seeing these really impressive objects that they maybe hadn't even seen before in their whole life and the chief being able to say, okay, hey, let's all get together. We're gonna say thanks to everybody who brought these over, who helped make this possible. We're going to give uh, this person, this one for helping supply these resources for the trip. And part of the value too, which I didn't mention earlier, is that a lot of these stones have their own pedigree. So they might be named after somebody who, you know, a famous navigator who brought that back, or maybe even a famous a warrior or a clan group or something that would have supported this effort. So this in a very public forum was a way for the chief and everybody around to know that this particular stone has this level of importance. We're going to place it over here and everybody knows who owns this at this point in time. And because these were really important exchange valuables, they weren't something that you would just normally use to go buy food down at the grocery store, you know, in a modern sense, or to, you know, go get taro or to get some fish that you know, somebody had caught. <clears throat> these were used in more important events, uh, marriage ceremonies, birth ceremonies, or, you know, to maybe ransom the corpse of a conflict, you know, so you could get somebody back for a proper burial or something. So these were really important kinds of objects and used in these important displays that would have made it a lot easier, I think, for them to kind of keep track of who had what. An interesting thing to note is that the stone didn't need to be physically moved or transported. In fact, ownership of the stone could be transferred with the stone remaining in the exact same location. They were placing these in certain locations and that that transfer of ownership would take place without necessarily having to move it. Really, a lot of people around the world have assets that are not in their immediate location. Rai was one of the first organized systems of currency and record keeping. What's particularly interesting is that by creating Rai, the Yapis were an early pioneer in blockchain technology that's used today. In fact, Rai was an early implementation of the distributed ledger concept that today's Bitcoin blockchain technology is based on. Here's a quick comparison. Bitcoin relies on a distributed ledger called the blockchain. It's basically a shared record of who owns what. Rai relies on a ceremony with a chief and others who bear witness to a transaction as it's taking place. In both systems, there's no central bank, meaning there's no central notebook of all the transactions. Instead, the notebook or ledger is owned by everyone in blockchain's case and witnessed by the chief and everyone else for Rai. Another similarity is the mining of a new currency. I'm sure you've heard of Bitcoin mining, or in other words, creating new Bitcoin. As for Rai, of course, these coins were literally mined, being pulled out of the ground, shaped into Rai, and then transported back to Yap. When you look back at the ways in which traditional societies around the world have used exchange valuables, whether those are stone or metal or shell or lapidary items or whatever, really in Yap, it's the only case that we know of where you do have this 
evidence of an oral ledger of people really making a strong effort to keep track of who owns what. And these rye stones, of course, are very visible features that are easily identifiable. They're not easy to move. And that's something that you can more easily keep track of. And I think that that is an interesting corollary to how blockchain operates, just so you can maintain some faith in the system. There's transparency in terms of how those assets are stored and, and moved or exchanged. And we, even though this is conjectural, we do suggest that even if there was a pinprick of an idea about how you should or could structure an electronic ledger in order to keep track of digital currencies, I think Yappy's yeah, Stone Money is really the best way to conceive of that. History often repeats itself. And it's incredibly fascinating to think that a group of people on an island in the Pacific Ocean hundreds of years ago were able to create a technology and system that we use in modern times today. One of the things that's interested me most in each one of those is just the parallels that they're able to find between, you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago with the things that we do today and looking back and finding things that were built or made or used or whatever it may be that you know, we didn't give credit for. And so thinking to something that we, again, look at as so futuristic in the blockchain and finding parallels and, and origins in something uh, so much older is just really incredible. It's one of the innumerable cases of the past having influence on the present. And we can learn from what we've done in the past. And a lot of ideas that we have today aren't necessarily new ideas. And we still don't have really great explanations sometimes for how people in the past were, were doing things. And they did some very extraordinary things that scientists today are still trying to figure out and debating. I think this is just another small but, but very interesting example of that.